Okay. Um, my name is Heng Yang. Uh, I'm a professor from UC Riverside. Uh, so this is a work uh, with my students uh, Wei Song and uh, collaborators Chang Liu and Dong Song from UC Berkeley. Uh, unfortunately, uh, my student couldn't come because of the the visa issue. He kind of messed up with the visa application, so I have to <laughs> present on behalf of him. Um, Anyway, so uh, here I'm going to present our work uh, called DeepMan Learning uh, Graph Neural Network Models for Fast and Robust Memory Forensic uh, Analysis. Um, first of all, what is memory forensics? It's um, a branch of digital forensics. Uh, you know, traditionally, um, you know, people extract information from hard drives um, you know, to collect some digital evidence from for crime or malware, but more advanced attacks that uh, they become more stealthy. So uh, they try to avoid leave, uh, leaving footsteps, I mean footprints in hard drive. Um, so making this kind of analysis uh, uh, increasingly uh, irrelevant. Um, so nowadays, more and more. Uh, forensics, uh, you know, analysis tools focus on memory because no matter what, benign or malicious, uh, the program has to uh, reside in memory to function. So uh, this is why uh, memory forensics are, you know, more and more important. Um, there are lots of valuable information in memory, uh, ranging from running processes, injected code, uh, network connections, credentials, and so on. Right, so there are lots of information in memory, um, but memory in general is pretty large. Right nowadays, you have eight gigabytes or sixteen gigabytes or more, and there are all kinds of data structures that you need to uh, look into. So the problem itself it can be um, pretty complex. Um, in terms of existing techniques, uh, the first kind of technique is called uh, data structure traversal. <clears throat> Essentially, you start with a um, root pro uh, root object. Uh, at the known location, uh, in this case, say uh, you have a PS active um, process list, uh, process hat, um, and then uh, you start to uh, traverse the pointers in this data structure to reach more objects. So in this case, you reach a e process object, and then from this object, you start to uh, traverse the forward pointer to reach the next process object. So you, go, you do this on, on and on until you reach you know, everything, uh, all the objects in the in memory. Uh, so this approach in general is uh, pretty efficient, right? So you pretty much just follow the pointers that you can reach objects. Um, so this is uh, one approach. Of course, you do need some kind of knowledge in terms of data structures, known locations, uh, to actually come up with a traversal policy or rules. Uh, the second uh, approach is called signature scanning. Um, so in this case, you need to come up with um, a unique pattern or signature to identify the objects in memory. Uh, so for example, this is a, this is a signature for e-process. Um, then you examine the bytes, the first byte, second byte, or third, um, you know, D words. And uh, as long as they satisfy this kind of value constraints, then you think, oh, this is an e-process object at this location. <laughs> um, as you can see, you have to examine every offset in the memory, when the memory dump is pretty big, then you know this process is not very efficient. <clears throat> so let's let me go through the limitations um, once again. So for data structure traversal, uh, well, I didn't talk about it, but the problem is uh, it's not very robust. Um, so there's a known attack uh, method called the decom attack, which is uh, uh, referred to as um, uh, direct the kernel object manipulation attack. Um, so in this example, attackers might just unlink this e-process uh, e -process object from the linked list. And if you use a data traversal approach, then you're going to miss this object. Okay. So this is a very simple and very effective approach uh, to evade this, this, uh, this um, analysis. <clears throat> Um, signature scanning is not very efficient. You have to scan every single offset in memory. Um, there, and it becomes even more uh, expensive if you have to make your, your signature scanning more robust. So for example, SIGGRAPH is a paper published in NDSS uh, 11. And uh, this signature approach not only examines the, um, 
uh, the value constraints, but also points to relation. Okay, so uh, make, make it more robust, but uh, since you have to examine more data, more pointers, more <coughs> objects uh, down the road, several hops away, then it makes it uh, uh, even more expensive. So for example, for in the paper, it mentioned that for 256 megabytes memory dump, it takes up to 15 minutes. But nowadays you have eight gigabytes memory and you have more kinds of objects. This is only for e-process or you know, test structure objects, uh, test structure. So it, it's pretty expensive. Um, on the other extreme, uh, PS scan is a very simple plugin in volatility. Uh, it's very, very fast, but in order to make it really fast, you actually skip large memory regions um, just using very simple heuristics and then check very simple patterns. As a result, it's very easy to evade this approach. Um, and then in the end, um, no met, uh, for both data structure traversal and for uh, signature scanning, we need expert knowledge, okay? The data structure definition, the semantic meaning of a pointer, what kind of constraints are more robust than others, um, and so on, to come up with the traversal rules, to come up with the signature patterns, okay? So um, we think the fundamental bottleneck for the existing approach for this problem is that this is a rule-based uh, you know, scheme, um, it's determinist, De uh, deterministic, so it's very easy to evade. Um, if uh, one of these rules is, is violated, you violate the whole thing, right? And also hard to come up with uh, uh, these rules. It requires domain knowledge. Um, so we believe that a learning capability is uh, uh, essential or desired uh, for following reasons. One is that um, you know we like to automatically learn the intrinsic features from real data instead of manually come up with these features or rules. Um, and the second, we comprehensively evaluate all the bytes, not just some small set of bytes, um, so that if somehow attackers manipulate a small portion of these bytes, um, you know, it doesn't affect our final detection result. And surprisingly, this approach is actually really fast. It's not as you think, you know, I have to go through all the bytes, have to, you know, uh, come up, I mean, go through these models is very expensive. In fact, it's really fast because, uh, you know, vector and matrix computations are generally pretty fast. I mean, just in CPU, not mention GPU, GPU is even faster, right? Um, so to be more specific, uh, our basic idea is like follows. Um, we turn memory dump into memory graph, okay? The reason we do that is that we like to capture both memory content information as well as topological information. So the neighborhood information, also the points to relation and so on. Um, and then we, you, we learn high level feature representations from this memory graph using a neural network. In this case, we use a graph uh, neural network. And then uh, we perform supervised learning, which means we're going to use some labeled data for training, um, and then we can train this uh, feature learning and train the classifiers. Um, and then for detection, we just use a learned model and, and an unknown data set uh, to make a classification. So, um, and let's look at uh, these two, two uh, stages. The first one is for training. We start with some memory dumps. Uh, to, a, to, to be able to label the memory dump, we can use existing tools. For example, Volatility has a whole set of tools to identify memory objects. <clears throat> well, you might, you might ask, oh, why Volatility? If, if it's uh, infer inferior to your tool, why do you use it? Well, if actually uh, Volatility is pretty accurate for at least a benign data set, right? It may not be robust for malicious data set, but it's good enough for benign data set. Our goal is to be able to learn a model which is more robust than volatility, and sometimes even faster for, for some, some of these tools. Okay, and then um, we go through um, this graph constructor um, to generate the uh, memory graph and then we have the label generator, in this case, volatility, and to label 
uh, the nodes in the graph. <coughs> and then uh, we feed this information into our uh, neural network. In this case, we have two networks uh, combined together. Uh, the first one is an embedding network, uh, which actually converts the, um, the raw data, raw feature, into some higher level representation as a feature vector. And then uh, the classifier will uh, take the, this feature vector as the input and make a classification. <clears throat> and then uh, for training, we're going to train these two networks together in an end to end fashion. So, uh, you know, that's how we do it. Um, and then for detection, uh, we start with unknown memory dump. And then we go through the same um, graph constructor to generate a memory graph. And then we go through this learned model. In the end, we are going to generate uh, you know, the node labels for this uh, memory graph. Okay, so this is not the end of the story. Uh, and then we, ha we still have an object detection to generate kernel, uh, to detect kernel objects. The reason is the node in the graph is not an object. It's actually a memory segment uh, um, that within the memory object. So there may be multiple segments in one object. So in this case, we, uh, we perform like a voting uh, among these objects, um, among these nodes to, uh, to determine whether there's a true object at the given location. <coughs> So um, yeah, let's, let's talk about what do we mean by memory graph so you know better uh, what I just mentioned. So uh, in a memory dump, and we first scan memory dump to find a pointer-like field. OK, so the, look at the content and see, does it look like a, a real address? OK, if so, we are going to mark them as a pointers. OK, and then anything in between is a node in the graph. OK? So this is a node in the graph. Um, in this case, we have A, B, C, D, and E. So they become a node in the graph. And then, um, first of all, we let, let's use C as an example. First of all, we look at the neighbor information. So we know um, we create a neighbor, neighbor edges. So B is a left neighbor. So we create edge LN from B to C. And D is a right neighbor. And we create an edge called RN from B to C. Um, and then we also look at pointer edges. Uh, in this case, we have two pointers. One is the left one, and the other one is the right one. And then we create one edge from A to C as a left pointer, and, uh, and E to C as a right pointer. OK, you may, you may notice that the direction is uh, the opposite of actual pointer direction. Um, you know, we have some arguments for that, so the details pretty read the paper. So but you, this way, we come up with a, this memory graph. And then uh, we feed this graph into these this two you know, network, um, you know, <clears throat> networks. And we, we're going to uh, generate an, uh, node labels. OK, so then uh, first, let, let's look at the um, uh, embedding network. Um, so the embedding network is a graph. Again, so it's a graph uh, neural network. So what it does is that it, it takes multiple iterations to compute the embedding for each node. For each iteration, we take the content of the node and then all the neighbors embedding at time t and then go through some nonlinear transformation. Then we generate the embedding for the node at time t plus. Uh, so we do this uh, for multiple iterations, which means after t iterations, then the embeddings for the node n will actually incorporate the neighbor's information within t hops. OK? And by, do the, by, by uh, perform this uh, you know, uh, supervised learning, then in the end, we suppose that embedding for each node uh, you know, carries some high level uh, representation of the node. So this is uh, actually the, the, the trend result. The embeddings for each kind of object you can see uh, they actually clustered very tightly, so which means the learning is actually very <laughs> effective. Um, okay, and in the end, we generate uh, the node labels. I mean, we classify the, the labels. In this case, T16, T54 example, uh, they represent 
for example, the, uh, the thread object at offset 16 and uh, you know, thread, ob thread node at uh, offset uh, 52. And then we perform object detection to use the labels per node uh, to you know, detect or to determine uh, the uh, kernel object, the object. Mm -hmm. Okay, the base idea is using a uh, voting scheme. Uh, as you can see, if we know T16 at this location, T52 and T84 at this location, then that all points to that at this location there's a threat object, then we are you know, very happy with this detection. Uh, but sometimes you know, maybe uh, you know, some label is not as we <laughs> expect. Uh, then we need to kind of um, you know, voting by majority uh, to determine whether th this is actually a true object at this location. Again, so the detailed formula, how we calculate it, is in the paper. <clears throat> okay, so that's the uh, general idea. Uh, let's look at uh, our result. Uh, we evaluate our system uh, in with, with respect to detection accuracy, robustness, and efficiency. Um, and uh, we prepare our data set using um, VirtualBox. We run Windows 7. Uh, and then perform lots of random actions to uh, kind of uh, uh, stimulate the uh, OS current um, operating system to allocate random objects at random locations. And then we uh, choose a random interval to dump uh, the memory. Okay. Uh, and then we label objects using volatility. So some people may ask, why not Windows 10? Okay. We can do Windows 10, but somehow the volatility does not work very well for Windows 10. So we couldn't do that. Um, so let's look at accuracy. Uh, we look at uh, you know, six kind of objects in Windows kernel. Uh, as you can see, the, uh, the order from the, the, the largest object to some smaller objects, and the precision recall in general are pretty high. Uh, you, can, you can also see that for some smaller object, like this, this one, only 60, only 44 bytes, and uh, the precision is uh, a little bit less than the other objects. Uh, but in general, uh, the accuracy is pretty good. Um, then let's look at the robustness. Uh, we uh, conduct, us, uh, I mean, three kinds of evaluations to uh, evaluate the robustness. The first one is a simple, uh, it's a put tag manipulation attack. So most, uh, many of these tools in volatility rely on pull tag to detect objects. So for example, uh, a file scan uh, use the pull tag uh, FILE four bytes to detect the, uh, the file objects. So if we, uh, you know, uh, mute, uh, change these bytes, so we likely will, um, you know, mess up with this tool. So this is actually indeed what happens. Uh, as we can see, uh, majority, I mean, um, most of the, the files, objects are not detected by this file scan plugin. Uh, and that's why the, the recall is really, really low. There's one exception. I'm not sure whether it is because we, we forgot to manipulate this pull tag or some other reason. Somehow there's uh, one object survived from this uh, attack. Um, but uh, deep mem can actually identify all the, uh, I mean, uh, still can achieve very high recall and precision, almost no, uh, no impact. Um, in addition, we also conduct a DCOM attacks. So in this case, we actually uh, set the forward link to be null, which means we actually uh, hide all the e-process object except the first one. Okay, so. Um, <coughs> This approach is also very, uh, this attack is very effective against uh, the PS list in volatility. Um, so again, the recall dropped to 1% uh, because the first one is still visible to this, uh, this tool. Uh, and uh, in comparison, DeepMan works also very, very good. So it has 100% precision and 9977 recall. So it still can, survive from this attack with no problem. Uh, so fu fundamentally, the reason is that, you know, uh, the deep learning approach, DeepMan, evaluates all the memory bytes, right, as a whole, 
comprehensively. So if you just multiply one or two or a few bytes, it doesn't affect the final result. So furthermore, we evaluate how much we can mutate. So, so make, make the, our system suffer, okay? So we, then we perform random mutation. Um, so we start to manipulate one or two bytes and then start to increase the mutation ratio and see how the accuracy drops, okay? So uh, as you can see, uh, this one is the result for process. This one is the result for, e, uh, for threat. Uh, the precision remained the same. It doesn't affect precision, but the recall does drop um, after you know, like a 40 bytes mutation for e, pro uh, for e process and the 20 bytes mutation for, for threat. Um, so this is uh, kind of shows to what degree our system can, uh, be, can tolerate uh, this kind of uh, manipulation. But just keep in mind, you know, as an attacker, you can't arbitrarily, you know, manipulate memory content, right? So you are, you are, you are taking the risk of crashing the system. So, uh, so theoretically, you can tolerate 40 bytes, doesn't mean you can actually do it. So very, very likely you may actually uh, crash a system by just make, make, uh, flipping some bytes. Um, okay. And then let's look at efficiency. Um, so we have training. Uh, it takes like 13 hours to train one model uh, in our server nodes. Uh, in this case, we have uh, two GPUs and 32 core you know, Intel CPU. Um, so uh, it does take some time, but um, you know, it's a one-time effort. So we can afford that. For detection, in this case, we use a, just a moderate uh, you know, Intel iCore I mean, uh, I, Core i7 um, and no GPU. So it's, uh, everybody can afford that. Uh, as you can see, for detection, it takes about 80 seconds to generate a memory graph. And then uh, we have, uh, it's about 13 seconds to detect one kind of object. So you may have, for six kind of object, you may have, you know, 70 seconds or so. So it is much faster than the, you know, the SIG graph I mentioned earlier. Um, I mean, there's still a room for, for improvement. For example, you can use GPU to improve this, and you can also, uh, you know, uh, in, in parallelize the, the graph comparison, I mean, graph construction to make makes this uh, performance uh, much better. So in conclusion, uh, we propose DeepMem, a deep learning-based kernel object detection system. So it captures the both memory content and points relations and perform end-to-end learning. No expert knowledge is needed. And we can achieve high accuracy, high robustness, and high efficiency. That's all, thank you. Uh, just a question regarding Windows 7 and Windows 10. Have you considered that maybe uh, it works in Windows 7 because there's no ASLR by default? No, we actually checked the dumps. Uh, the, the, the ASR is enabled and uh, the the random the the memory dumps are actually actually very random oh, the locations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, about the robustness of the attack, uh, I think you deleted some uh, link. Mm -hmm. But the example in the uh, earlier part of your presentation, you did uh, uh, evade the one process. Mm -hmm. And why did you do a different way? Um, it's it's probably a bit arbitrary. Uh, <laughs> it's done by, by by my student, so maybe he has a better answer for this. <laughs> so um, I think, in some sense, this is a more even more severe, you know, manipulation uh, than the one that we pre present earlier. Yes, mm -hmm. because I, I'm asking this because in the uh, your example, the structure of the graph is preserved, but in the earlier part example i think it's uh making a very uh, exceptional pattern so mm -hmm. it may not be found by uh <laughs> current method i think um i'm not sure oh. yeah we can we can talk offline yeah, yeah. One, one more quick question hi thank you for the presentation uh I know that uh, VMware or VirtualBox can have some memory footprints 
uh, that you can detect that you are in a VM. For... So did you okay. try it on bare metal, even if it's like costly on one or two occasions to dump a memory bare metal to see if the model could actually generalize to bare metal systems? Uh, we, we didn't. Um, we didn't try the bare metal. Uh, but fundamentally, our mod over I don't I don't see the the difference between you know the bare metal and the, the memory dumps in in virtual memory I mean in virtual machine uh, I mean in this case because we don't actually have any malware running in the in the system so uh, whether the malware detects the virtual machine doesn't matter in our case okay yeah thank you very much okay let's thank the speaker again.